Hey everyone, in this video we are going to go into some examples of how businesses actually might take advantage of cloud technology. So before we really get into some of this, I want to define the term cloud provisioning. It is the allocation of cloud resources to its customers. So a cloud vendor is going to have a lot of different customers that are using all of that server space for different things. And a cloud vendor has to determine how to provision all of those resources so that each of its customers has enough in order to maintain you know, whatever they're trying to do on the cloud, whether it's web server hosting, whether it's data storage, et cetera, et cetera. All of them need to have enough cloud resources in order to actually do what they're doing with the cloud based on their payment plan, of course. So this cloud provisioning could include things like allocating specific resources within a server. So we talked a little bit about an example of a website suddenly getting a lot of visits and needing additional sort of web servers to handle that all of that additional traffic. And that would be the allocation of additional resources within a server or even additional servers within a massive cloud server farm. Um, there might be a, the allocation of resources to help handle all of that additional traffic, just as an example. Uh, you could also look at additional server locations worldwide because a cloud vendor might have a lot of different servers in a lot of different places all across the world that they can allocate resources for a particular website to. So even if the website is for a company based in, say, the United States, they might be able to allocate additional resources in Australia or uh, East Asia or Europe or something like that in order to better serve customers who might be trying to visit the website from those particular areas if there is suddenly a spike in demand. So let's take a look at some of the ways that this might be applicable, that cloud provisioning might be helpful for a company. So we talked a lot about resource elasticity in the last video, how you can do all that work, you know, allocating additional resources when a website needs to handle additional traffic or something like that. And what we have here is an example sort of based on real life data for an example company that is running ads during a major televised event. The textbook talks about a car manufacturer um, running televised ads during the Academy Awards that direct people to its website and the ads run at around two and four. Um, and what we see is peaks in usage, peaks in the amount of people who are trying to visit that website at around the times that those ads are running because they are running in times that a lot of people happen to be watching that program and a lot of people end up going to the website because of that. So this is a benefit for the cloud uh, or from the cloud, I guess, because in the past that company, you know, when they're making their ad, they would have had to think like, well, what can our servers actually accommodate? Would we be able to accommodate a huge spike of people who are trying to visit our website? If we can't accommodate that, then our ad is practically useless because, you know, people, if people can't go to our website, it's like they never even tried to visit in the first place. So, you know, how many people can our servers handle? Should we build up more servers? But then what if the ad completely flops and nobody shows up? Then would we have wasted all that time for and and money for nothing? You know, both the advertising money and any sort of server expansion money. So they would have had to think about a lot of those problems, but thanks to the cloud providing resource elasticity, thanks to the cloud making it so that additional resources can be allocated on the fly, um, you can actually handle cases like these. So when the usage spikes like this, um, you can totally handle that, no problem. You just 
throw on a few more uh, web servers trying to host that actual website and direct people that way, maybe even uh, throw them up in different areas across the world based on where a lot of consumers are seeing this ad and trying to actually visit the website. Maybe um, the car manufacturing company is based in Japan, but a lot of people are trying to visit from the west coast of the United States and a good amount are visiting from the east coast, but there's not a, a ton visiting from central United States. What you could do is you could have, uh, the cloud vendor could have uh, allocations for this company's website. A lot of them in the western United States, uh, a good amount in the eastern United States, because there's typically servers located in the western and eastern United States to handle some of the more populous areas. And then maybe a few located in other areas, like uh, actually in Japan or East Asia as a whole. Um, maybe a couple in Australia, if anyone in Australia is watching a American broadcast of the Academy Awards. And then in less populous, dense areas like Central United States, where there's not nearly as many people who might be watching the Academy Awards and visiting the website because of this, uh, maybe they're fine to go to the Western United States servers, and that should be okay. So that would be an example of resource elasticity through the cloud handling a close to real world example. So with resource elasticity, the idea is you're adding additional servers to compensate for additional load. Those servers can be location dependent to reduce wait time in global regions like we talked about. And it's less costly if only needed for a short time. So if you only need those additional servers to handle the peak loads, these uh, peak loads right here, if you only need them for a little bit of time, it's much less costly because you only pay for the amount of time that you need them for. And then when you don't need them anymore, you can just work with your normal server load, then you can pay your normal rate again. So it's less costly than trying to uh, beef up a massive server just for handling the worst case scenario. And then you have a server that's sitting mostly idle most of the time, just waiting for the worst case scenario, which might only happen very rarely. So that's a huge benefit of the cloud. Then we can go into the idea of pooling resources as well, which we um, also talked about in the last video, but essentially um, you have all these server resources being allocated as needed thanks to pooling, thanks to the fact that the cloud vendor is pooling together all of these resources and allocating them as needed. So it's able to keep all of these companies servers and data storage and all that kind of stuff it's able to keep all of that in one sort of area in in one um, network of servers and with all of the extra uh, server space that it has it's able to allocate that extra service space to any one of those clients as needed so anytime any one of those companies needs extra server space the cloud vendor can allocate that extra server space to that company as long as that's needed. And then they can free that up and have it be ready to allocate for the next company that needs a little bit of extra. So that's really a really important aspect of the cloud is that it allows uh, cloud vendors to respond or it allows businesses to respond to demand thanks to the cloud vendor's ability to pool all its resources together and allocate anything that's spare to any one of the businesses that needs it. So yeah, we talked about this quite a bit already, but the extra resources can be allocated to some customers as needed. And then when those customers no longer need them, those extra resources are freed up and can be given to other customers when th those other customers need them. And then the customers only pay for the extra resources when they need them. Typically what you have is you have some kind of plan where you pay for like a base amount of service, you know, a base amount of data 
being sent to other people, you know, when they're trying to connect to their web services or something like that, you, you pay for a certain connection speed, a certain load on the server as your sort of base load with a plan that allows for that kind of increase that we keep on talking about when there's a higher demand for their services. And that plan will um, say like, well, hey, if you need up to this amount of extra connect connectivity for people visiting your services, using anything you're hosting on the cloud, whatever, um, if you have, like, we'll, we'll let you sort of expand up to a certain amount of connectivity and we'll charge you a higher rate while you need that connectivity. But then as soon as it's done, we'll take that extra server space back and you can pay your regular amount again. And then, of course, there's the fact that the cloud is available over the internet, um, which means that you can get access from anywhere. And this can be especially beneficial for um, if you are an employee accessing things that your the company you work for uh, has hosted over the cloud. You're able to access that kind of stuff from everywhere. Cloud uh, vendors have server farms across the world, which allows for the provisioning of resources across the world. So you could be on a business trip halfway across the world and still have easy and fast connection to your company, uh, to the company you work for's uh, resources, because odds are you'd be able to access a certain provis a certain uh, server provision that's much closer to you than, you know, if you're halfway across the world from home, the closest server to you there is not going to be the closest server to you when you're on your business trip. So this provisioning here is super, super useful for companies who are trying to make resources available for their employees across the world. It's also really, really beneficial for serving customers from across the world. There was a time when it took a very, very, very long time to access anything across the ocean because that data was traveling through fiber optic cables along the bottom of the seafloor all the way over to, um, you know, wherever in wherever places in Europe or Africa or Asia or whichever continent that you're trying to access, you know, you have to use these uh, undersea cables in order to transmit data over there, which is incredibly slow. So thanks to cloud vendors having these server farms across the world, they're able to sort of transfer that information across the, um, across the ocean using these fiber optic cables laid out across the bottom of the ocean that are constantly being attacked by sharks, apparently. Um, they you know send whatever cloud services across the ocean onto servers on land on the other side of the ocean and then those servers are actually quite accessible for people who live close to them so what you can do is you can host your website all across the world through these um, services through these cloud services, thanks to the fact that they're able to provision resources from all around the world like this. Now, there are standards in place for requesting and getting services that allow for provisioning. So there was a time when you sort of had to work it out with the cloud vendor to figure out server provisioning in order to meet demand or things like that. You would have to actually do some sort of negotiation for how you would set up your web services so that the cloud servers could actually, you know, provision things. They could allocate more resources for you, allocate resources in all kinds of other places. And things could get a little messy because they were making a new uh, agreement with every single company and things could occasionally Break, but now there are standards for how anything that uses the cloud with web servers and all that, there, there's standards for how those are created so that uh, provisioning can happen really, really easily nowadays. 
Now, there's different levels of service offered by cloud vendors, and that's essentially to meet your needs as a consumer of cloud services. There's different ways of getting these cloud servers and different prices that you're going to pay for the different types of services. And it all comes down to what you're trying to use the cloud for. So let's get into what this really means. Let's get into the different services, but we're going to look at this through the lens of another market, one that might be a little more familiar. So let's take a look at that. All right, so in this example, we are looking at transportation, specifically in terms of cars uh, as a service in the way that we might think of cloud services. So what we have are all these components of uh, car driving, so the gas, the actual act of driving, insurance, cleaning, repairs, registration, testing, assembly, and actually getting the parts. Now, there are different models of uh, transportation in this model of transportation as a service, and they all involve the different ways of obtaining a car and driving it somewhere or you know using a car to go somewhere and this is from this is looking at the process from the very beginning where someone is sourcing parts in order to actually build a car to the very end where the actual driving is being done now one method of doing this is uh, actually building the car yourself from scratch. So you are buying all the parts, you are assembling it yourself, testing it yourself to make sure everything works, paying for the registration, paying for the repairs, cleaning it, paying for insurance, actually driving it, and paying for gas. So you are involved in every step of the process from actually building up the car to using the car. Then you can look at buying a car. So you buy a car that has already been built. The manufacturer has sourced the parts, assembled everything together, and tested the car to make sure that it works. So you know that the car should work pretty fine. All you have to actually take care of is the pieces that come with owning a car. Registration, repairs, cleaning, insurance, driving, and gas. And you'll see these um, right here, these different... Uh, services, these different names of services, these are the uh, actual software, you know, the cloud software services that we will be comparing this to. So building a car from scratch would be traditional on-premises, it would be comparing it to building a server yourself and managing that server, but we'll get to the equivalence in a little bit. Uh, just know that buying a car would be considered infrastructure as a service. That's how we would that that's the equivalent that we would do there. Then there's renting a car. So the vendor, the car vendor, in this case, the taxi company. Well, okay, so there would be a couple vendors in play here. There would be the car vendor that actually builds the car, tests it, assembles it, all that kind of stuff. And then the uh, car rental company, which would take care of the registration, the repairs, and the cleaning. And then you as a consumer would still take care of the insurance, the driving, and the gas. So that would be platform as a service. The platform itself is the car. That platform is completely taken care of. You're just putting in the work to actually use that platform, actually drive it somewhere, and you're paying for the insurance that, has, that goes with uh, driving that car. I'll uh, go back to buy a car really quick. This is known as infrastructure as a service. The infrastructure in this case is the car itself because the service is building up that infrastructure for you so that you can use the infrastructure. So they're building up the car in this case so you can use that car, so you can actually drive that car, but you have a lot of maintenance and fees and stuff that you have to pay because you are buying the car. And then... Of course, you have the option of taking a taxi where everything is managed by the vendor all the way from the auto parts, you know, or everything is managed by vendors. So everything from sourcing the parts and building it to driving 
the car and paying for gas. You don't manage anything at all, but you have very little control over the actual car itself. You can't decorate the car. You can't um, choose what kind of car it is or who's driving it or anything like that. You are just along for the ride. In this case, this is software as a service. You're just using this service to, you know, in this case, go from one place to the other. So you're just worrying about that purpose of it without also worrying about all the things that you uh, would have to manage if you owned your own car that you were driving here. Um, so that's sort of the idea that we have. The car as a platform where you have an infrastructure that is being built, uh, a uh, platform that is actually being managed through registration, repairs, and cleaning, and stuff like that, and then the actual purpose that that platform, the things that that platform does, namely drive you around, that would be equivalent to like a software in this sort of example right here. All right, so here is the equivalent of these ideas uh, for actual actual cloud services when you're talking about servers and hosting things and all that kind of stuff. So for cloud services, the traditional on-premises is when you're actually building up your own server. So you're setting up the network, the storage, the servers, you're figuring out the server virtualization, creating virtual servers within your servers in order to you know allocate different resources for different people who might need them throughout your organization. So setting up the operating system on those virtual servers uh, setting up the middleware and runtime that people need to actually work with those servers, and then the data and applications, you know, you're managing all of that, how all of that is stored on your servers there. Then you got infrastructure as a service, which is a very common type of cloud service being offered, IaaS, infrastructure as a service, where the cloud vendor will set up the network, the storage, the servers, and the virtualization, and they will allocate certain virtual servers to you that you're able to use for your company, for your company's purposes, whether that's data storage and sharing, whether that's uh, hosting applications, all that kind of stuff. So it's up to you to then take those virtual servers that they give, set up the operating system, and all the programs needed to interface, allow people to interface with that server, and then manage the applications and data that are hosted on that server. We also have platform as a service, uh, PaaS. This handles everything except for the data and the applications. So everything is already done for you. You just need to start using it. You start hosting the data on there. You start running the applications on there uh, for people in your organization to use. Uh, but they handle all of the more technical server side stuff. And then finally, you have software as a service, which is really just an all in one picture. Software as a service would include things like Google Drive or OneDrive or all that kind of stuff. Um, it would include the Microsoft Office 365 suite of applications. Those are all being run on a server where, you know, everything is being done for you. Uh, the only thing that you have to do is just use the application. Even like Alan Hancock doesn't have to really do much with this. They have to pay for site licenses and they have to make it available to everyone within the organization, in our case, within our school. But really, um, there's nothing that has to be done on the technical side by any of us, by any students, by administration, by teachers, anything like that. We don't have to worry about that. The servers, the operating systems of uh, running on the virtual servers, on the servers, that's all being taken care of. Um, the actual data and applications that's being hosted and managed by Microsoft. They're hosting and managing our OneDrive data and the Office applications that we're using. 
we just have to worry about using the things. So that's where software as a service comes in. That's probably the one that you all would be most familiar with. All right, so what we have here is just a table that describes who tends to use each cloud service and some examples of those cloud services. So we talked a little bit about uh, how we all have used uh, software as a service. Um, we, in this case, would probably fall under the uh, customer's side of things. Um, but we use software as a service when we use Office 365. Also, OneDrive. When we use OneDrive in order to store files, that would count as using a software as a service as well. The software being used is a file management software that would work quite similarly to something like Windows File Explorer or Finder or whatever Chromebook or Linux equivalent there might be. I know there's about a million uh, file explorers out there for the various different Linuxes, but those are programs that are running in order to let you manage where your files are located and what files you have, um, allows you to move them between devices and allows you to delete them and so on and so forth. OneDrive and Google Drive work very similar, where you would upload your files there, move them between folders, open them, delete them, edit them, whatever. Um, so OneDrive would also count as software as a service, as well as Google Drive and all of their associated suite of applications to work with that data. iCloud also counts as software as a service for the exact same reason. It provides uh, data storage and it provides ways for you to interface with iCloud in order to access your files. Now, iCloud tends to be pretty well integrated in with Finder, um, actually in the same way that OneDrive is integrated in with Windows Explorer and in the ways that you can integrate Google Drive in with Windows Explorer and possibly Finder as well, I'm not entirely sure, but also how you integrate Google Drive in with the Chrome OS File Explorer. So there are applications in place there that facilitate that integration that allow those applications Finder, Windows Explorer, whatever, to access the file structure contained within the actual server. So those all count as software as a service. And then also Salesforce would count as software as a service as well. For platform as a service, uh, this is going to be a bit more technical um, of a use case. These are used by application developers and testers, and they're really good ways for actually creating applications and testing applications meant for different platforms, you know, uh, different um, applications meant for different operating systems. So this would be things like Google App Engine, uh, Microsoft Azure, and Amazon Web Services Elastic Beanstalk, which are all meant to help with the development of applications for all sorts of different platforms. Essentially, they have a server going on with an actual operating system installed on top of that server and then people put applications onto those servers so that they can access those applications and develop and test and all that kind of stuff so the operating system is there all the server hardware is there it's just a matter of the people who are actually developing and testing applications they have to load up those applications onto these servers so they can start running everything. And then once they start running those applications that they've loaded up, they can actually do their development and testing work. So that's what platform as a service tends to be used for. And then finally, you have the infrastructure as a service, which is typically used by network architects and system administrators. And all this does is this provides the basic server uh, hardware and it sets up the basic, the actual overall server operating system and sets up the virtualization so that you can create virtual servers, which is then what these network architects and system administrators would be working with. They would be working with the virtual servers set up by services like Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud and Amazon Simple Storage Engine. 
And from there, those network architects and system administrators would be able to load up their own operating system, load up all their own programs that need to be used, and they can really set up an environment that is going to be useful for the company as a whole. They can really optimize everything so that those servers can be used really well. So for example, do you need to rent out a server to do a ton of really complex calculations in order to train a machine learning system that might give you some amount of profit based on predictions that it's able to make? Well, maybe infrastructure as a service would be really helpful here because your system administrators can set up an extremely lightweight operating system that can facilitate all of this um, heavy, heavy calculation and then start running an application that allows the AI engineers to actually start working with the artificial intelligence, to actually start doing the calculations, start doing the training, all that kind of stuff. So if you need a lot of configuration of a virtual server while still having the benefits of the cloud, including things like resource elasticity, this could be a really, really helpful uh, solution for your company. The nice thing about infrastructure as a service, rather than actually building your own uh, server, is that the cost savings are massive. You don't need to worry about doing all the research into building a server or even multiple servers. You don't need to worry about the space, you know, renting out the facilities if you need to, making sure that the temperature of the server is going to be cool if you're doing a lot of calculations, making sure you have all the hardware that you need, uh, making sure that you will be able to continually use that hardware for things that are useful, even if maybe one per particular project fails, you'll still be able to put use into that hardware to get money out of it. You don't need to worry about making a plan for repairing and maintaining and upgrading the servers or anything like that. You can just rent out space from a cloud provider, get rid of all of the worries that come with assembling the physical hardware, and just get right into setting up a server that you're able to use however you want to. So. Infrastructure as a service is incredibly cheap compared to setting up your own system. Uh, even though you're paying likely a monthly rate or something like that, it would take a very long time for that monthly rate to ever catch up to the cost of maintaining server hardware. And even then it might not ever catch up because server hardware does actually have to be actively maintained. You have to upgrade materials. You have to continually pay for power and pay the salaries of people to maintain the physical servers and all that kind of stuff. So it might never be worth it to build your own server when infrastructure as a service exists. So that's something to think about. So if you are in a position where you have to create an information system and for whatever reason, the cloud looks really beneficial to you, it's really important to know the difference between software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. Uh, figure out the intended use cases for each of these different types of services, whether you need something that can be used by any regular employee because they need access to a word processor, or if you need something really technical because you're doing this hardcore calculation in order to figure out something for marketing, let's say, and you need a very particular server setup that you can't really find anywhere else. You, know, you need to be able to assess what you need from cloud services, and then you need to figure out which actual cloud service you need based on what you need from them. So whether you it's most appropriate for you to use software as a service or platform as a service or infrastructure as a service, that's going to be an incredibly useful skill to know the difference between these three and to be able to decide which of the three is most appropriate for your service or for your information system. And then you need to know what the requirements are for actually using these services, whether you don't need any technical requirements at all to use the services or whether you need Sys, uh, system administrators, people who are really comfortable with setting up networks, um, 
in order to use this service. You need to figure out who you need to add to your team in order to facilitate these cloud services as well, if you even need to add anyone really to your team. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is content delivery networks. And we kind of got a little bit into these ideas when we talked about hosting a website in different servers located around the world, close to people who were trying to access that website. And we're looking at a very similar idea here with the content delivery network. So it's a system of hardware and software that stores user data in many geographical locations, and it makes those data available on demand. So it stores user data in many geographical locations, ideally close to the users that are using that data. So there's a lot less time that users need to wait in order to access that data. Internet speeds are fairly fast right now for those of us who are fortunate to be living in relatively populated areas like we are, um, Santa Maria and San Luis Obispo, where I'm currently filming from. Uh, this sort of central coast area has really fast internet speeds compared to what a lot of other people kind of have to deal with living in more rural areas. And for people who are living with a lot slower internet speeds, content delivery networks make things a lot easier because the distance between them and the data that they're trying to access is going to be a lot shorter so they don't have to wait nearly as long in order to access that data. Um, in the past, content delivery networks weren't really a thing. You would actually be sending your request to access a piece of data all the way over to where that piece of data was located. So for example, if you're trying to visit a website uh, located in the United Kingdom back when the internet was new, uh, your request would be going all the way over to the United Kingdom and then it would you know, request to access the website and then the website data would be transmitted back over to you, but that would take really slow as well. We talked a little bit about the undersea fiber optic cables that the sharks seem to love to attack nowadays. Um, and that travels all the way back over to you and that's going to take quite a bit of time because there's quite a bit of data back in that day uh, traveling over to you through those undersea fiber optic cables. And then finally, you know, you get that website and you can look at it and everything is good until you actually have to click another page and then load another website and so on and so forth. And, you know, if there's an image on that website, oh goodness, that could take even longer because those images could be quite sizable in the kilobytes even back in that day. Nowadays, we don't really have to deal with that, but content delivery networks do a lot to help make things a lot faster, especially when we're accessing things that require a lot more data, like uh, internet video or something like that. It Keeping that data close to populated consumer bases makes it easier for those consumer bases to access that data very quickly. Here's kind of what I was talking about with this whole idea of accessing data from where it actually was located, right? We have this media company located in, you know, Eastern California, uh, Central Eastern California, and it is trying to deliver media to computers located all across the United States. And that's going to be fine for these people located up uh, north of Sacramento, actually kind of uh, covering the area that I grew up in, funny enough. Uh, so that's going to be relatively short distance. Uh, down in Arizona, it's not too far of a distance. Washington's getting a little bit further. Um, all the way over here in the uh, states that I do not have the best memory of, unfortunately. So I will not try to guess them for the sake of not embarrassing myself even further. Um, customers located over here, it's going to take a lot longer for that content to be delivered to those customers. So it's a little bit inefficient. It works just fine for customers who are located right next to the server, but 
does not work great for customers located on the other side. And is the answer to move the server smack into the middle of the United States? No, not really. Uh, for one, the business probably isn't even located in the middle of the United States. It's probably located right where those servers are or pretty close to them. So that probably wouldn't be the most helpful. Uh, also, maybe most of that uh, most of the customers trying to access that data are on the West Coast or close to the West Coast of the United States. So it does make more sense for the customer's servers, or for that uh, company's servers to be on the West Coast in order to serve as much of its customer base as possible. Uh, and everyone else just kind of has to deal with it. So you have all these kinds of questions that really we could just solve with something like a content delivery network. So here's what the content delivery network actually looks like. You have the main server of this media company right here, but then you also have the content delivery network servers like this. So these are much smaller servers that actually get uh, some of the copies of the data from the media company right away. Uh, the media company just distributes their data across to the content delivery network before it's even requested by any of its customers. And then the customers, rather than having to get data from this hub server like this, the customers can actually just go to the nearest content delivery network and request the media right from there. And that's going to be a lot faster because those servers are much more centrally, centrally located to the different customer bases of this company. Um, makes it a lot easier for people to access the um, media that this company is putting out. So that's the benefit of the content delivery network is you are sort of making all that media essentially available much closer to the actual customers, making it a lot easier for them to access that media or whatever data you're trying to work with in general. And that's kind of getting into these ideas that we were talking about with the cloud, with some of the resource pooling across servers located in all kinds of different areas is that, you know, you can make things accessible for, um, different people who live in different areas you can make it you can bring that data that they're trying to access a lot closer to where they live rather than having to go all the way to them from the regular server now we would consider the content delivery network to sort of be its own specialized type of platform as a service so the content delivery network could be part of a cloud server. Um, you know, it could be actually set up by a cloud vendor and a company could take advantage of this content delivery network in order to distribute its uh, data to customers in a much more efficient way. So it's likely not that the um, media company here itself would be setting up that content delivery network. Rather, it would be taking advantage of an existing content delivery network set up by a cloud vendor in order to make it a lot easier for its customers to uh, get access to the media that this company is putting out. Unless that media company happens to be something like uh, Disney or YouTube or Amazon or whatever, in which case they might have control of their own content delivery network. I'm not. YouTube and Amazon for sure, maybe not Disney, but likely this would be a company taking advantage of an existing content delivery network through cloud vendors. So there's a lot of benefits of using a content delivery network. Um, one is that it has a decreased load time for users trying to access content. We talked about this quite a bit. Um, a user on the East Coast of the United States would have a long load time if they were trying to access data from a server on the West Coast like this. But with a content delivery network, uh, if they are accessing a server on the East Coast of the United States, 
then they're going to have a much shorter load time. So a lot of the work of transferring data across the United States would have already been done automatically as soon as the media company released whatever media that they've done and that media gets copied to all of these content delivery network servers that would have already been done when the user actually requests uh, access to a piece of media from the nearest content delivery network server then that only has a short distance to travel over to the user so that's really helpful there's another really helpful uh, benefit which is that there's reduced load on the origin server so coming back up to this image here um the origin server is going to send out data to all of the servers on the content delivery network that it's connected to. And that is going to be most of the work that it probably has to do regarding uploading media to make it available for people to watch. When people are actually trying to access that media, then they're going to be contacting the content de uh, delivery network servers directly which means that they're not talking to the main media company server. So the main media company server doesn't even have to touch that. They don't need to worry about getting those requests and transferring that data over to every single user. They've already done that work. So the load gets transferred over to the content delivery network servers. And because each of those servers is handling a very specific geographic area those servers don't by themselves don't have a ton of load that you know they're they're able to handle everything that they are getting all the requests that they are getting there just fine there's no one server handling every request from all around the country that's completely unnecessary in this model so all of the load is distributed across this network and it ends up being a lot stronger for it because any of these servers is much less likely to crash or have problems because it's getting too many requests more on that later i also want to talk really quick about how uh, this is quite a bit more efficient than the model without the content delivery network because in this graph we have one computer per content delivery network server, right? But in reality, there's going to be a lot of different users that are all being served by the content delivery network server. The efficiency comes in in the sense that this really far distance that the media company has to push a, you know, all the files that it's trying to make available, it only has to push that once in a content delivery network kind of model. It only has to send files one time over to this particular server, which might be handling 1000 users, right? Whereas without the content delivery network, uh, it's making that same trip about a thousand different times for those 1000 users who are all living in that same area. So it's quite efficient because you're only transmitting data across this really far distance once in the content delivery network model. And then from there, when the 1000 users are trying to access that media from the CDN server, uh, it only has to travel a short distance from the server to those users. So it cuts down on a huge amount of redundancy when you're working on the content delivery networks. So I mentioned that there's increased reliability in a content delivery network, which very much is true. Um, you don't have a lot of people trying to make uh, requests to one server. You don't have one server handling, delivering, in this case, media to all of the different customers like you would in the model without the content delivery network. This is one server handling everything. And if that one server goes down, everything goes down. Whereas in the content delivery network, uh, that one, you know, any one particular server is much less likely to go down because they are much better suited to handle all the requests that they're getting from users. Each one of these content delivery network servers is getting far fewer requests than 
the uh, main server was when it was working by itself, so they should be able to handle things just fine. Also, if one of these content delivery network servers goes down, the worst case scenario is that a small fraction of the total user base has a blackout. Well, hopefully a small fraction. It probably depends on the demographics of the entire user base. Um, but likely, the way content delivery networks are set up, they all take a relatively small fraction of the user base, of the expected user base at the very least. So if one goes down, likely a relatively small fraction of users will be left without that content. In the absolute worst case, in the much more likely case, they will instead be visiting the next closest content delivery network server, which should still be able to handle it. It should still be fine. You can sort of distribute the rest of those customers across different servers in the content delivery network and sort of distribute the load that way, the load that comes from one of those servers going down, and everything should work out relatively fine. And if the main media company server goes down for whatever reason, no user is actually directly connected to that media company server, so they wouldn't notice any difference. Uh, they would still be able to access files from the CDN server, which is running the last known uh, copy of all of the data that, it, that they were given from the main server. So they're still able to access everything. Maybe they will notice that something that was supposed to release hasn't been released yet because the main server is down, so they weren't able to push it everything to the content delivery network server, but that's fine. They can deal with it. The network as a whole stays up. It would take every server on the network going down at the same time, which is very unlikely, typically, unless there's like a nationwide blackout or something. It would take every server going down at the same time to actually shut down this whole thing. I guess the other likely scenario would be if the uh, media company stopped paying. But yeah, it's much more reliable. There's less likely to be any accident that takes down everything. There's also protection from denial of service attacks. So a denial of service attack is when someone maliciously uh, tries to send a lot of requests to a network. So many requests that the network is no longer able to handle it, or at least the server running the network is no longer able to handle it, and the thing just completely crash crashes and shuts down and it takes that whole uh, server and whatever was running on it down for a quite a long period of time until people can get it back up. Nowadays you might be more familiar with the term DDoS, uh, distributed denial of service. That's when uh, all of those requests come from a massive network of computers rather than just a single computer because a single computer uh, sending so many requests in order to try to shut down a server that can easily be blocked. You can just filter out the IP and say, don't let them, I don't actually listen to anything coming in from them. And that works relatively well, but a massive network of computers, likely something called a botnet. Uh, I won't get into it in this video, but feel free to ask me what a botnet is if you're interested. Um, a distributed denial of service attack would be a lot of different computers making a ton of requests all at once in order to take down a network. And the reason why a content delivery network is protected from this is because of the fact that likely they would be attacking these front-facing servers right here, these front-facing CDN servers, because in all likelihood, a customer isn't actually attacking the main server like this. So if they're taking anything down, they might be taking down a local node of the CDN server, and they might be able to do some damage to multiple of these nodes, unless you know they're stopped in the meantime. But... Um, yeah, because they're not actually able to go after the main media company's stuff, uh, that server is protected uh, from the distributed denial of service attack. 
And also in the case of a distributed denial of service attack, um, oftentimes you have a lot of computers from all around the world that are participating in this distributed attack, uh, oftentimes without the actual knowledge of the people who are who own those computers, funny enough. But computers from all across the world will be participating in that attack, attacking that network, but because this is a lot of different computers from a lot of different locations, those computers are probably likely be attacking different CDN servers. So a coordinated attack becomes a lot more difficult because it's really hard to um, actually focus in on one particular CDN server. So it might even be able to just eat all of those requests, no problem, depending on how uncoordinated everything is. So that's a huge benefit right there. Now, the textbook talks about reduced delivery costs for mobile users specifically because it takes less time for data to come to a particular device if you're using a CDN, and they equate this to it costing less if you have a limited data plan. I don't know where they're getting this from because they, I, I, I think they must be thinking about minutes, like cell phone minutes back in the day. You had a certain number of minutes for actually calling on the cell phone and a certain number of minutes on things like AOL uh, or some other dial-up service. You had a certain number of minutes that, or hours or days or whatever that you could connect to the internet for based on the amount of time it took to pass things through the cell phone or the, sorry, the landlines. Um, I really think that's where they're getting this idea from because it just doesn't make sense in the modern world anymore. Um, data planes nowadays are based on the total amount of data you are downloading through a network. They're not based on how long it takes that data to get to your phone. So I thought about it really hard. I did all the research I could into how cell phone plans actually work. Um, a lot of that data appears to be very obfuscated and a lot of the top results appear to be uh, articles potentially written by uh, machine learning systems, funny enough. Just really comes across that way. But um, yeah, I don't know what they're talking about here. I really don't see how a content delivery network leads to reduced delivery costs. I don't see any feasible way that that's possible. So take that with a grain of salt when they talk about it in the textbook. And yeah, uh, the last benefit is there's this pay as you go um, thing, which is actually kind of how it works with a lot of the other cloud services where you pay for what you're using. You're paying for the amount of data that your users are downloading off of the content delivery network rather than actually paying for like the actual servers and all that kind of stuff. If you're setting up your own content delivery network, that would require you to actually just pay for the entirety of the server hardware, no matter if you had to use that server hardware or not. Paying as you go would refer to the fact that you only pay for how much people are using the content delivery network that you are, well, renting out essentially. So that's another benefit right there is you don't need to worry about building up all those servers for people who um, might possibly need them, but you don't know how much they would need them necessarily. And maybe they'll need them different amounts at different times. You don't need to worry about that. You only need to worry about with a content delivery network paying as much as those content delivery network nodes are being used by your customers. So the last way that businesses might use uh, cloud technology is actually setting up some of the web services that cloud technology might normally bring inside of an internal server. So we've talked about some of the situations in which you actually have to very carefully control your data. If it's not possible for 
you to put your data on the cloud because maybe for legal reasons or maybe because this is the choice that the organization has made, uh, that data must be kept in a place where you know exactly what is happening to it, you know exactly what will happen in the case of a disaster or an emergency or something like that. You have to have that data on site, no questions asked. And you, what you can actually do is host some of the web services that you might be accustomed to through the cloud on an internal server. So we have uh, actually a database server right here that's accessing a uh, web server that's running some database applications that is being accessed by the web browsers of people's computers in different departments. So you have this fake web server that is hosting an inventory application, a database application interfacing with the database management system here that people are then accessing uh, Microsoft Office 365 style. They are accessing this through their web browser in order to do work. Now I say it's a fake web server, it's running all the same software that a actual web server would, except for the fact that you can't actually connect to it from outside. There's no way of getting into it from the outside internet. You can only access it from inside the building. So it looks like a web server. You would access it by typing in an address in your web browser, but you can only do that when you are inside of the office building. Now, this is still a static, relatively static server, this idea right here. So there's none of that resource elasticity or any of the other benefits of the cloud just yet. We'll talk about a private cloud in the near future, but um, this works well in the case where you need a web application, but you can't actually keep your data in the cloud. It's still completely possible to host that web application on your own internal server and then use that web application in order to do the work through a web browser uh, by just connecting to a local website that is only accessible through that uh, local internet. None of the benefits of resource elasticity, if there's a huge customer service crisis and like 1,000 customers need help all of a sudden, um, and there's a huge load on this web server from the customer service side of things, a bunch of people are trying to run the customer service inventory application. Um, there's no resource allocation to give them more resources in this time of crisis. A server admin would probably have to manually go in and close a whole bunch of other instances of the applications and give the customer service a bit more priority, if that's even something they were able or willing to do. Um, when we talk about private cloud, we'll look at a situation, or we'll look at a solution to this kind of problem right here. But in short, you know, it is possible to host web services internally. Like in theory, you could set up a server and set up Microsoft Office 365 on that server and then use Microsoft Office 365 if the software weren't proprietary, uh, which it is, so it's not actually possible, but theoretically, it is something that you could do. All right, well, that is a video on how companies use the cloud in all kinds of different ways. And we got a lot more into the different aspects of using the cloud. Um, in the next video, we'll talk about internet security and how that interacts with the cloud.